this is Professor Rod Evans, and this is the lecture uh, for the 11th chapter of Business Ethics, Business Ethics, and uh, the 8th edition by William H. Shaw. This is the 11th and final chapter, and it is a particularly important chapter, uh, and it, it is on job discrimination. Now, because there's been a history of unequal treatment of women and minorities uh, in the United States, um, and attitudes behind that inequality are to some degree still alive in, in many people, legislators have created laws against job discrimination. Uh, now, Shaw, our author, lists criteria, criteria for job discrimination. Is the decision a function of the person's group membership? Is the decision based on prejudice, false stereotypes, or the assumption that the group is inferior and deserves unequal treatment? Is the decision harming those it's aimed at? Discrimination can be conscious and quite uh, deliberate, or it can be unconscious but still quite real in its effects. Discrimination can be by individuals or it can be by institutions. There are many reasons for condemning uh, discrimination. By making false generalizations about entire groups and acting on those uh, generalizations, people not only harm individuals but also disadvantage society by depriving society of people, productive, creative people, and their, their works. What's more, no rational person, no rational person would want to, uh, anyone to discriminate against him or her. Now, the, the book talks about statistical evidence. Um, our author, Shaw, gives uh, what he calls, again, statistical evidence for discrimination, including the differences uh, in income between white males on the one hand uh, and black males uh, and black females on the other. Note that although there are no doubt uh, forms of racism and sexism and other prejudice in this country, showing economic disparities among groups won't automatically demonstrate discrimination or the degree of its seriousness. At the very least, even when there is discrimination, the amount of discrimination isn't necessarily exactly equivalent to the differences in the wages between groups that aren't discriminated against and those of groups uh, that, uh, uh, that are discriminated against. I mean, for example, uh, there are sharp differences in uh, incomes between Jewish people as a group and Jehovah Witnesses uh, as a group. Uh, but those, those differences and income don't necessarily speak to discrimination. There are also very large differences in education between uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and, uh, and Jewish people. Uh, further, the same person will usually make more money at age 35 than at age 22. That is, there's a wage gap between people just entering the job market and middle-aged people, yet that gap doesn't prove discrimination. Still further, there aren't many Jewish and Japanese players in the NBA but their absence uh, doesn't tell us anything about uh, discrimination. There are very many reasons why, uh, well, why you don't see a lot of Jewish or Japanese people in the NBA. One of the many reasons is that uh, the median age uh, for Jewish Americans and Japanese Americans is, uh, is about 50. Still further, certain fields pay more than others because they are connected more closely with industrial productivity than other, other fields. In general, you could say there are several techni technical fields where mathematical knowledge is required. And where that's the case, white males take more graduate degrees than women and members of some minorities. Consequently, engineers usually make more money than teachers. And engineering professors who are predominantly male usually make more money than English professors, many of whom are women. Although it's important to talk about discrimination, it's also important to talk about the strides that have been made. For example, the black middle class uh, is larger today than it was at the beginning of the Civil Rights uh, era. 
What's more, many black people who immigrate to the United States have incomes higher than those of many white people born in the United States. Regardless of the amount of racism in the country, people's futures are also largely affected by their choices. For example, young Caucasian women who become pregnant and drop out of high school usually have a much more difficult time than other young women who have, have who've made different choices. I want to talk about what Shaw, uh, Shaw calls attitudinal evidence. Our author Shaw asserts there are unwritten expectations in firms that can make it more difficult for females to advance. Many men want to be around people who enjoy and like to talk about sports. Yes, there are many women who know a lot about sports. In fact, there are many women who know more about sports than many men. Yet at the same time, uh, it could be that as a group, men are even more inclined to talk more extensively about sports than women. Uh, and so that could maybe uh, make it more difficult for women to get along with uh, those men, or at least the women who are not as inclined to talk about in, in sports. Also, uh, we often have double standards when it comes to men and women. Many men uh, admire really assertive guys, but they'll describe assertive women as, quote, bitchy, end quote. And that doesn't seem to be particularly fair to women. In short, there are negative stereotypes among managers and executives, and these stereotypes can influence hiring, promotions, and the treatment of workers. I want to talk about affirmative action uh, within a legal context. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the claim that separate but equal facilities uh, were legally permissible. Uh, the High Court asserted that segregation facilities were often unequal and that the desire to segregate the races was itself based on an unacceptable belief in racial inferiority. So you've heard about Brown v. Board of Education. That was a rejection of uh, separate but equal. Uh, in the 1960s, there were a number of laws passed by the federal government to protect people from sexual and racial discrimination. And those laws culminated in the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1964, prohibiting all discrimination based on race, color, sex, religion, or national origin or national origin. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, companies were required to develop affirmative action programs in which guidelines were created and people were appointed to try to ensure that women in various groups would not be discriminated against even if unconsciously. Although many companies have not only accepted affirmative action but also found it compatible with making profits, many Americans are to some degree still divided over affirmative action policies. Our author Shaw does a good job of giving us the early legal history of affirmative action and, and uh, from beginning with the Abaki case. And I just want to read this to you. This is uh, from the uh, Supreme Court's position uh, and this is Shaw's giving us again a very uh, brief history of the of affirmative action, especially its beginnings. Uh, he says the following. The U.S. Supreme Court's first major ruling on affirmative action was in 1978 in the case of Bakke, in the case of Bakke, v. Regents of the Uni uh, University of California. Alan Bakke, a white man, applied for admission to the medical school at the University of California at Davis. Only a tiny percentage of, of doctors are not white. To help remedy this situation, Davis's affirmative action program set aside for minority students 16 out of its 100 entrance places. If qualified uh, minority students could not be found, those places were not to be filled. In addition to the special admissions process, minority students were free to compete through the regular admissions process for the unrestricted 84 physicians. When Bakke was refused admission, he sued the University of California, contending that it had discriminated against him in violation of both the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the Constitution. He argued that he would have won admission if those 16 places had not been withdrawn from open competition and reserved for minority students. Bakke's grades, placement test scores, and so on were higher than those of several minority students who were admitted. The university did not uh, deny this, but defended its program as legally permissible and socially necessary affirmative action. 
Now I want you to know this. Bakke, in fact, won his case. Like a lot of influential cases, it was five to four. So he won his case. Again, it was a five to four decision. And announcing the judgment of the court, uh, Justice Lewis F. Powell's opinion rejected explicit racial uh, criteria setting rigid quotas and excluding non-preferred groups from competition. At the same time, Powell held that the selection process can take race and ethnic origin into account as one factor and pointed to Harvard's admission uh, program as a model. In such a program, quote, race or ethnic background may be deemed a plus in the particular applicant's file, yet it does not insulate the individual from comparison with all other candidates for the available seats, end quote. Powell also granted that numerical goals may be permissible when the institution in question has legally discriminated in the past. Okay, so I want you to know that. I want you to know that Bakke was a Caucasian, that Bakke sued uh, the uh, University of California uh, for uh, discrimination, that Bakke won his case. Remember, Bakke wanted to uh, become, and wanted to go to medical school, okay? And we're talking about the University of California at Davis. Uh, and, okay, so that, I want you to know that. You need to know that case. Uh, now, the, there are some other things that uh, I want to talk about. To get, to get a, uh, a feel for what critics of firm action are saying, what they're saying, um, I'm going to quote from uh, Justice Clarence Thomas. Now, again, I'm not uh, trying to arbitrate any, uh, between or among different positions. I'm just trying to give you some of the different positions. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, Clarence Thomas. Justice Clarence Thomas uh, has opposed affirmative action, and this is his position. Of course, there are people who obviously disagree, but this position represents a certain number of people. So let's look at what uh, Thomas has to say. Okay. There is a, quote, moral and constitutional equivalence, end quote, between laws designed to subjugate a race and those that distribute benefits on the basis of race in order to foster some current notion of equality. Government cannot make us equal. It can only recognize, respect, and protect us as equal before the law. In my mind, now this is the mind of uh, Justice Clarence Thomas, government-sponsored racial discrimination based on benign prejudice is just as knocked as discrimination inspired by malicious prejudice. In each instance, this is racial discrimination plain and simple. Okay, so that's his position. His position is that we should have equality before the law, but he doesn't uh, approve of affirmative action. And, uh, okay, so in any event, um, now, the other thing that I want to talk about is, uh, by the way, I do want you to know, at least very roughly, uh, the arguments for and against affirmative action. Um, and those are given in your book on the la in the last chapter. And I think you pretty much understand what those are, but I mean, I do want you to know uh, what they are. I mean, some people say you, we need affirmative action uh, because of the, uh, there's still discrimination. Furthermore, there is, uh, you have the, the residue of systemic discrimination, uh, and this is greatly hampered uh, the ability of many uh, members of minorities uh, to advance and so that we need affirmative action to help level the playing field, right? And then you know there are other people who say that affirmative action can adversely affect uh, white males who have not discriminated against anybody. Uh, but in any event, I want you to know some of these basic arguments for and against discrimination which are covered. Uh, I mean, you could, heck, you could go to Google and look at arguments for and against uh, uh, affirmative action. I, should, I hope I said affirmative action, not discrimination. But anyway, uh, affirmative action. And the fact of the matter is, uh, you, I want you to know roughly what they are. Uh, now, the other thing that I want to talk about is comparable worth. Women as a group have historically been in more low-paying low jobs than men have. Okay, we know this. Uh, in response to those historical differences, people have advocated the doctrine of comparable worth holding that men and women should be paid on the same scale, not just for doing the same jobs, but for doing different jobs of equal skill, effort, and responsibility. I want you to know that. Advocates of comparable worth hold that justice requires giving women equal pay for the work of comparable value, judged by education, skills, experience, and responsibility. Now, some advocates 
have argued that women should, in fact, receive reparations for having historically received less pay. Now, opponents of comparable work insist that, uh, that women today have normally freely chosen lower paying jobs and that they are free to become lawyers, doctors, and engineers. And I might add, more and more women are going into law and medicine. Further, opponents of the doctrine of, of comparable work say that if all businesses were required to increase their pay to millions of women, their costs would go up without any rise in productivity, a recipe for inflation and economic hardship for many businesses. And still further, opponents of comparable work argue that the doctrine, if universally acted on, would destroy uh, professional women's basketball because women's basketball doesn't generate enough revenue to pay uh, the female players the same uh, income as that of the male basketball players. In fact, the opponents argue that income disparities can be a function of market forces and not the product of arbitrary sexist decisions. In fact, opponents of, of the doctrine of comparable worth say that there's no non-arbitrary way to determine the value or the worth of a job apart from market considerations. Further, even where, there, where males predominate, such as in boxing, those areas will show discrepancy in income. For example, the featherweight boxers typically earn less than the heavier weight of boxers, uh, including welterweight and middleweight. And when there are extremely talented heavyweight boxers, as when Mike Tyson was in his prime, they usually earn more money than uh, people in the lighter weight divisions. Opponents of Compaworth say that, that men have historically dominated technical fields, including uh, engineering, computers, mathematics, and the hard sciences. Those fields are tied more closely to industrial productivity than fields traditionally attracting more women. A social scientist well known for writing on gender issues is Warren Farrell. That's F A R R E L L. Warren, W A R R E N. Warren Farrell. Uh, Farrell has written several books, uh, one of which argues that, generally speaking, women in America today are, are not s systematically and systemically paid less than men, and that to the extent that there's any pay gap between men and women today in America, it is a product of women's choices. Uh, there's this, there's actually his book, whoops, uh, let's do this, okay. Now that book, uh, Why Men Earn More, The Startling Truth Behind the Pay Gap and What Women Can Do About It. Here's what he has to say. He says, to the extent there, that there appears to be a pay gap, you can explain it because of the different jobs that men and women take and the different working conditions they have. Let me just give you some of his findings. He says, first, men are more likely than women to take jobs uh, in technical fields of the hard sciences rather than the arts or social sciences. Think of pharmacology rather than, let's say, literature. Men are more likely to be in hazardous fields with hazard pay. Think of male combat soldiers uh, versus female administrators in the Air Force. Men are more likely than women to work in sleet and heat rather than in indoors. Think of uh, FedEx deliverers versus receptionists. Men are more likely than women to be in jobs that people cannot psychologically check out out at five. Think of corporate attorneys versus librarians. Uh, men are more likely than women to be in fields that, that pay more, but uh, at least some people find less fulfilling. Think of uh, engineering versus uh, being in child care. Uh, men are more likely than women to be in fields with higher financial and emotional risk. Think of venture capitalists versus supermarket cashiers. Men are more likely than women to work the worst shifts during the worst hours. Think of a private practice medical doctors versus HMO medical doctors. Men are more likely than women to work in unpleasant environments. Think of prison guards versus restaurant uh, hostesses. Men are, are, are often more likely than women to be in luc more lucrative subfields. Think of someone being a surgeon rather than, let's say, a psychiatrist. Now, Warren Farrell, who has a doctor in political science, submits that to the extent that women's pay differs from that of men, that all or nearly all the difference can be traced to women's taking different choices, making different choices. Um, as when women may prefer a job without 
overnight travel and that uh, a job that has summers off as in teaching. In short, many women have different priorities from those of many men. Women often value their family life over their careers outside the home, and many now seek out uh, highly competitive work, require them to be away, I should say many men, uh, seek out highly competitive work requiring them to be away from home 70 or 80 hours a week. Now I might add, also add that, that men are socialized to be more assertive and somewhat less agreeable and more aggressive than women. Uh, and those features can be uh, useful in the marketplace. That extreme competitiveness can be an advantage in the, in the, in the workplace, uh, including when it comes to asking for raises, by the way. Of course, women can be trained to be more assertive and to be more demanding in their careers. Dr. Warren Farrell's belief is that uh, the belief that all or nearly all the pay gap between men and women is mostly, if not completely, due to systemic sexism is not grounded uh, in the evidence, which is much more complicated. I might add further, if it were true that women, generally speaking, were being paid 15% to 25% less in every area of employment, why wouldn't employers go out of their way to hire all or nearly all women immediately increasing their profits and you know their bottom line. The reality is that there are market forces that explain a lot of income differences. And by the way, uh, female supermodels make more than male models. Uh, TV, uh, now I don't know about whether Judge Judy, whether she's still working, but I know that, that if, you could, if you look at Judge Judy's career, that she was certainly making more money than any judges uh, on or off TV. As pointed out earlier, uh, further, featherweight boxers typically make less uh, than equally talented heavier boxers. Engineering professors, again, typically make more than uh, philosophy professors, I mean professors in the humanities. Not all plumbers make the same amount of money, that mo but most plumbers are male, and talented plumbers can do very well. Often, 20% of the top salespeople will make 80% of the sales commissions. The point is that we can't explain the numerous complex factors that determine wages by simply assuming that the overwhelming factor is sexism apart from the numerous choices individuals make and the forces of supply and demand. Uh, here's a final word on com uh, com comparable work. It isn't clear how we could s uh, systematically determine the value of jobs based on some bureaucrat's assessment of equal skill effort and responsibility. If you want philosophy professors to make as much as engineering professors, are you willing to pay more for your tuition? How can we evaluate the economic worth of all plumbers, all violinists, all professors, all boxers, independently of supply and demand? And as I say, you can have very large pay gaps uh, among salespeople, and it's very common for 20% of uh, salespeople to make 80% of the money within sales. Merging economic with political considerations as happened in the former Soviet Union generally doesn't have a good track record for economic productivity. Uh, now what I want to do is talk about sexual harassment or harassment either way and this is a very important issue. In fact there have been many many very successful men who have uh, been, uh, I think, quite properly uh, gotten in trouble uh, for the sexual harassment or harassment, uh, and some of them have ended up in, in prison, as a matter of fact. Uh, now, what is sexual harassment or, or harassment? Well, it's unwelcome, and this is a key feature, unwelcome sexual advances requests for sexual favors, and other verbal or physical conduct of a sexual nature. Uh, and that they'll constitute sexual harassment when, one, submission to such conduct is made either explicitly or implicitly a term or condition of an individual's employment. Two, submission to or rejection of such conduct by an individual is used as the basis for employment decisions affecting such individual. Or, th or three, such conduct um, has the purpose or effect of substantially interfering 
with an individual's work performance or creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive working environment. Now, the two main types of sexual harassment or harassment, you've got the quid pro quo uh, type, and that occurs when a supervisor makes an, uh, an employment opportunities, makes employment opportunities conditional on the employees entering a sexual relationship with or granting sexual favors to the supervisor. Sexual threats are an example. You better sleep with me if you want to keep your job. You better sleep with me if you want to advance uh, at the firm. Such threats are obviously disrespectful and damaging uh, and illegal. And then the other form of sexual harassment is the hostile work environment. This form of harassment or harassment is sexual behavior that is so distressing that it interferes with the harassed person's ability to do the job. Sexual innuendos, sexually explicit emails, sexist remarks about people's bodies, and uh, um, sexually, well let's put it this way, persistently unwelcome sexual jokes, all of those can constitute uh, a form of sexual harassment and especially that which is involved in creating a hostile work environment. Here's some key points. First, although it is possible for women to sexually harass men and other women, and it's possible for men to sexually harass other men, most sexual harassment, as a matter of fact, consists of males harassing females. Second, when there's a hostile work environment, normally there is repeatedly unwelcome behavior. If a man is told by uh, women that they find his sexual jokes offensive and he repeatedly tells them over, you know, against their wishes, his obnoxious conduct is part of a pattern and can easily qualify as sexual harassment. Third, some isolated behavior could be offensive to a person but possibly not qualify as clear and definite sexual harassment. Let me, let me give an example. Consider the following case. Male worker A describes a sexual scene of an R-rated movie to male worker B, thinking that the two workers are alone in the break room at, at some job, right? In reality, a woman has quietly entered the break room and finds the description of the sexual uh, movie or should sexual movie scene offensive. Remember, they didn't know that she was there. They had no intention of offending anybody, but she happened to walk in and she may be a person who believes that people should not ever discuss uh, any sexual scene uh, within uh, a movie. They shouldn't discuss it uh, at all uh, during employment and at employment. Now note that the men, again, didn't know anyone else had entered the room. The situation, however, is sharply different from one in which a man repeatedly tells sexual jokes around women who have told him that the jokes are offensive to them. Okay, so I want you to understand that, that the, the, what I just described could be a clear case of sexual harassment. And uh, now, that's a very important topic, a topic we just talked about. Uh, and I want people to, uh, to understand the distinctions I was talking about. I think they're fairly straightforward. Okay, so basically I've covered what I want people to know uh, in the 11th and the final chapter of William Shaw's book on, on um, business ethics, uh, the 8th edition. Uh, thank you very much.